going to have to start calling you Satchmo Estrada. <laughs> what can't those Estradas do? I mean, do you play harmonica? Do you juggle? I mean, you guys just have so many talents. Thank you for sharing them with us here today for our worship. Um, I just appreciate all of our church members that engage and are part of our services, our worship teams, our elders, our uh, audio and visual team that makes all the things happen, our greeters. Uh, it's just so great to be part of a family that works together and everyone is here to try to make sure that our services are just as wonderful and a blessing as they can be. Earlier when I was introducing some of our newer staff, I did leave someone out and I want to uh, correct that. And so Gracia Campos, uh, our new third and fourth grade teacher from uh, Thunderbird Christian Elementary is here and I just want to welcome you also. Thank you so much for being called to education ministry and being part of our, our team here. And if I left anyone else out, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm trying. Um, draw me close. You guys chose draw me close. I haven't sung that in a long time. Have you guys sung that one recently? I haven't sung that in a long time. Do you know that that song was in our wedding? I mean my wedding to Gina. <laughs> We had, it, we had it played when we were taking communion, um, uh, a group called the Katinas. I think they're out of Seattle. Um, brothers have a beautiful version of that, and we had that played at our wedding. So, made me think wedding thoughts. <laughs> Let's pray together. Lord, we know that you are already here, but we just pause once more at this juncture to acknowledge the sacred opportunity that we have right now to continue to bask in your presence and to hear from your word and to be challenged to draw close to you. So, Father, uh, thank you for this church. And, Lord, thank you for these moments that we have together to think about what your plan is for our life. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. My... Uh, my message today is, is uh, probably a little shorter than normal, probably only 70, 80 minutes in that range. So we'll be, we'll be out of here not too long. Uh, I'm going to draw this kind of series to a conclusion this week with the end of the story and, and just to uh, remind kind of where we've been. I haven't had like a key text that I've been using, but this one did come to mind uh, to kind of illustrate the purpose of why we're analyzing you know, the story and where we play in the story. Paul says this in Romans 13, 11, do this knowing the time that is already the hour for you to awaken from sleep for now salvation is nearer to us than when we believe. And this idea, you now in the immediate context, Paul is talking about knowing the prophetic time, knowing where we are in, in the work of Christ for our redemption. But the sentiment of knowing where we stand within the greater scheme of things is a, is a biblical sentiment. And that's kind of what I've been trying to illustrate through these series of, of discussing the larger story. A lot of times we kind of just uh, place the story of redemption and the story of, of sin and everything that God is doing from creation to revelation, which is very natural. As you go from the first book to the last book, but when you dig deeper into the story, you realize that the first book, you're really in the middle of the story. And when you get to the end of the book, it's not quite over yet. And so it just is, I think, a helpful time to step back and remind ourselves of the broader and larger elements of the, of the story that we are all in. And so those are uh, some of the things uh, that I've been trying to bring out in this series. And so just a quick recap. The story began before creation. Before God creates, there is perfection. Uh, and then uh, because of the rebellion of the devil, sin enters the universe. So it's a universal story. Okay, it's not just about humans and God and the devil. Okay, there are angels, there are unfallen worlds. There is an entire universe that is caught up in this story. The, the, the main issue of the story is not just about whether God can save us, but the way in which he saves us, it, can it be consistent with his character? And I talked about that last week, that God himself is on trial. Even though he's the judge, the universe is looking at how he will judge. So um, it, God's character is a primary uh, challenge that Satan brought up and is, uh, is the reason for sin. And then again, this story is a love story. And the Ten Commandments and the law itself is an expression of God's commitment to us. And he invites us to make a commitment to him in a same 
uh, loving relationship. So now I want to come to the end of the story. And this thing's being really um, finicky. The scene, where are you? Next on the list. <laughs> We've been making some subtle improvements here and there, and, and this is one of them we need to work on. All right, so for the kids' quiz, and Toby, I know you just got back. Do you want to help out again? So we'll go with the black. And if we could have one more volunteer, that would be helpful. Or the scene. Or is this the one I'm supposed to be using? Am I supposed to be using the white one? So when you drop things and they break, you gotta do Tell me, let me just see if I can. Okay, let me try the white one. It seems to be working. Tell me everything you know about heaven. That's the question for our kids. I always begin my messages with an interactive time with young people in the congregation. No right or wrong answer here, really. Just uh, raise your hand. We want to get it in the mic so that the, when it's recorded, uh, it, people at home can hear and then others can hear. So I see Owen in the back with his hand up. Come on, guys. I need your help. Go ahead and, and grab Owen back there. Come on, kids. What do you know about heaven? Streets of gold. Streets of gold, right? Yeah, you've all read about the, the golden streets of heaven. All right, come on. What else do you know about heaven? All right, you have another one. Is that Sean? The gates are pearls. <laughs> and pearly gates, all right. So some of the building materials, uh, we know about that. Amy, what else? Is that all we know about heaven? Okay, right up here, Nassim. It's perfect. It's perfect. Wow. I like that. Back here. Oh, right back here. Yes, sir. What do you know about heaven? We need to we need to talk about this a little bit. That are that are a lot of angels. Angels? Well there you go. I mean, come on. What kind of heaven would it be if there weren't those beautiful angels? Come on, mom, dad, you can kind of give some ideas, elbow those kids. Ellie? Eternal life. Okay, eternal life. All right, that's good stuff. Dylan? The tree of life. The tree of life. Okay, we're getting them there, aren't we? Getting most of the things. Come on, anything else? Is that all that we know about heaven? Oh, yes, Ketsia. There will be the New Jerusalem will be up there. I, can you say it again one more time? New Jerusalem. The New Jerusalem, all right. And then, okay, and Isaiah? Water of life. Water of life. Andre? Got a concentration of them here, so we're kind of... Uh, Jesus will be there. Jesus will be there. Okay, we're going to come uh, back to... Okay, Owen, you're kind of giggling, so this ought to be good. It's where God lives. Wow. Good work, young man. I, I think you have excellent parents. That's what brought that to about. That's... Are you volunteering, Kim? All right. Um, one of our older kid children would like to participate. So, Kim, come on, Kim. Just one or two more minutes here. The lions will play with the lambs. All right. Animals will yes. be kind and gentle, and and uh, that's going to be exciting. Is that is that really the summation of what we know about heaven? Anything else? Okay. One more? Did you see one, Nassim? I saw, I saw Emma. Kind of, maybe. Emma, did you have one? Looks like your dad says you have one. No sorrow or pain. All right, no sorrow, no pain, no death. All right, thank you guys. I appreciate it. I mean, yeah, you've kind of touched on, on the most of them. Just to kind of recap, the Golden Streets, there's going to be a Central Park there with Tree of Life and, and, and uh, the River of Life. The houses aren't going to just be, you know, uh, shanties, right? They're going to be mansions. That's kind of the, the, you know, we've all sung the song and, and that the gates are going to be something remarkable. They're going to be great big pearls. That's going to be interesting. Nobody mentioned food. Are we not going to eat in heaven? I don't know if I want to go. Is there going to be food in heaven? Uh, there's the different foods that are kind of mentioned, uh, suggested, of obviously the fruit from the tree of life, uh, and then there's the marriage supper of the lamb, and, and uh, you know, there's obviously a lot of meaning to that. Um, who lives there? We talk about angels and saints. What won't be there? Well, death and dying and war and decay and, and sadness and all those things. There's going to be music. Is there going to be music in heaven? Uh, I think there's going to be a lot of music. There's going to be a great angelic uh, outcry. The, 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 the song of the redeemed, uh, the new song that Revelation talks about, light 
uh, Revelation says it's the source of light is going to be from God. The temple. Now, this is from a, a Christian uh, modern perspective. This isn't as profound, but from a, a, a more uh, Mediterranean and Eastern perspective, the presence of the temple equaled the presence of God. If you didn't have a temple, you didn't have God. And so Revelation makes it clear there's not going to be a temple there, which Jews would at first go, well, wait a minute, if there's no temple, there's no God. But then John says, no, you don't understand. There's no temple because God himself is the temple. Everything that the temple meant to symbolize is fulfilled in the, in the person of God. Um, so Revelation makes that. So really, when you put that together, that's not a whole lot that we know. And one thing that none of these really address is what will we be doing so a lot of times we take the end of the story and we say well it ends okay it's at the second coming well no it's not quite at the second coming because then there's the millennium okay at the end of the millennium uh then there's the judgment well that's not quite the end because then there's the new heaven and the new earth okay there's the new heaven and new earth then what then what we're all going to be wearing togas playing harps sitting on clouds for all eternity Sound like heaven to you? That's one of the popular conceptions, though, isn't it? So let me, I'm going I'm to have to tread lightly here a little bit. Let me just talk about some first initial misconceptions about the end of the story, about heaven. Popular, typical, not necessarily wrong, but can be misconceptions about heaven. First of all, when we say heaven... We really mean the New Jerusalem. And the New Jerusalem will not be in heaven. The New Jerusalem will be on earth. So we all want to go to heaven, right? You want to go to heaven, right? We all want to go to heaven. But heaven, in the, in the end, at the end of the story, will be the New Jerusalem, the city that is placed on planet earth. When Noah came out of the ark, he was still on earth, wasn't he? He was on earth. It was a renewed earth. It was a cleansed earth, but it was still earth. When we go to heaven, what we mean by that biblically, we don't always think of it as, it means residency and citizenship in the new Jerusalem, the city of God on a new earth. Are you with me? So that means that we're not on clouds, all right, and we're not in the ethereal atmosphere of space. We're going to be on planet or a new earth, a completely redone earth, but it's still earth, right? And that has a larger implication to what life and what the experience and what the end of the story will be when we remember that we're going to be here, not like it is now, not with death and decay and sin and all those things, but still a real planet, with real mountains and real forests and real animals. Is that okay? So sometimes we just remind ourselves when we say heaven, we do mean a heavenly celestial you know, connection with God, but it's going to be a real place on the new earth. Revelation 21 makes that clear. Okay, this is one that I always have to laugh at. So sometimes when people say, well, what are we going to do in heaven? Oh, it's just going to be eternal worship eternal singing and prayer and fellowship and, and hearing sermons that go on without end. Hallelujah. And I heard uh, John Eldridge said, if that's heaven, it sounds more like hell to me. <laughs> the, and sometimes we create in heaven in our minds that which we think is the pinnacle of the Christian experience on earth. So we think, well, the, the heightened uh, 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 experience of the Christian on earth is to go to church and, and to sing and to give and to talk and to fellowship and to hear the word of God and to study the Bible. So that must mean heaven is that nonstop. And that's not a happy experience when you think about it. And, and from a Seventh-day Adventist perspective, I've heard it said, and I may even have been guilty of this before, I don't know, of describing the heavenly experience as an eternal Sabbath. Not just church, but now you've got potluck that goes on without end, and you've got vespers and, and rest, eternal rest. You've heard of that, right? No more work, no more. No work at all. But then again, when you think about it, the Sabbath originally before sin was not seven days a week. 
The Sabbath was one day a week, even in that perfect Garden of Eden, right? And, they, and, and the, the, uh, the, the creation of God, Adam and Eve, and, and eventually their family, were expected to do productive, wonderful, and joyful work and then have a one-day experience with God. So even describing heaven as an eternal Sabbath does not really do an accurate portrayal of what the biblical understanding of the end of the story should be. So we need to be careful about these things. No marriage, no children, and no families. Now notice I put a question mark after that. No marriage, no babies, no sex. I almost put that on the screen, but I didn't want to have the word up there for you. <laughs> but I did say it. And no families in heaven. Is that what the Bible teaches? Now, I'm going to take about five minutes, Nassim, is that all right? Five minutes on this one, okay? Maybe it'll stretch it to six. We'll have to see how it goes. There is one statement in the Bible when Jesus is approached by the Sadducees, and the Bible makes it very clear, the group of people that approaches him. And they make up this story of a person who gets married several times. They keep having a spouse that dies. And then they ask Jesus, who will they be married to in the resurrection? And they're trying to trap Jesus. The Sadducees did not believe in eternal life. They did not believe in angels. They did not believe in the resurrection. Okay? They were kind of a materialistic kind of religion when it came to that. Okay? So they're trying to illustrate how the, how the resurrection doesn't make sense. And they think that they've trapped Jesus. And Jesus makes the statement, you misunderstand, for at the resurrection, they will be like the angels who neither marry nor are given in marriage. That's the only time, and it's in Matthew and in Mark. I don't even think it's in Luke. It's just in Matthew and in Mark. That one passage has been interpreted by the vast majority of Christianity, including Seventh-day Adventists, to teach that Jesus' teaching was, in the new Jerusalem, no one will ever get married. Marriage itself will be abolished. And if there's no marriage, then obviously there's no personal intimacy. If there's no intimacy, then there's no babies. And if there's no marriage, no babies, and no intimacy, there's no family. So it's God's plan that when we all go to heaven and get there, he eliminates those things. That is the official teaching of the Seventh-day Adventist Church and of most Protestant churches. I'm actually not sure what Catholics teach about that. I'm not sure if they go into that detail. Now, I put a question mark after that. And this is why. If it wasn't for that one statement by Jesus, the clear implication and thrust of every other passage that describes this period of time would suggest otherwise. It would suggest that the family relationships that we have on earth will continue in heaven, including marriage, having children, and the formation of families. Now, I'm not going to twist your arm on this, okay? I'm not going to demand one way or the other. I think there are ways of looking at and interpreting these passages, and we need to be careful. And this is something that I, I find interesting, and I have to acknowledge that in 1904, Ellen White writes a very strong statement about Jesus' comment to the Sadducees in support of the traditional interpretation. And I want to be respectful because we believe God used Ellen White in a very special way to benefit and bless our church. So this is not the thrust of the whole sermon. Have you been watching? Am I at four minutes yet? Okay. Um, this is not, but I just want to, I want to leave open the door of possibility that we can still honor the integrity of the scriptures and we can still understand appropriately what Jesus said by that statement and still leave open the door for the possibility that the other passages of the Bible that speak to this can be equally true. I just find it interesting that the pinnacle experiences that God designed for us to have on earth of marriage, having children, and having families is somehow incompatible with his ultimate design for us. And from a Jewish perspective, that would be very odd. Very odd indeed. And we're going to look just briefly at a couple passages. And I want to acknowledge that both the Biblical Research Institute and the um, Adventist Theological Society, have, and I respect both of these institutions, they're conservative Adventist institutions, have written on this, and both have urged that we be open-minded. That we be open-minded. And if you want to talk more, I, again, I, I, can, I can talk more. I think, I'm going to talk more apparently. I think when Jesus was talking to the Sadducees, he said, at the resurrection, which you don't believe in, I'm paraphrasing, they're going to be like the angels, which you don't believe in. 
So don't really worry about it because I have a plan that's going to take care of this. In addition to that, Jesus uses that phrase, the resurrection, which could be a reference to the period of time that we call the millennium. That is the period of time between the resurrections that we would call the millennium, which is a time of judgment and when the process of, uh, of, anal of analyzing God's work will take place. And in the Old Testament, when the priests were operating in the temple, they had to be chased. Remember when David came to eat the bread that he wasn't supposed to? Okay, remember when he's running from Saul and he comes to the high priest, he says, we're starving. Okay, and Abiathar the priest says, well, you know, this is the, the dedicated bread, you can't have it. And he says, but we're going to die. Abiathar says to David, have the men kept themselves from women? Have they been chased? David says they have. He says, then you can have it. So there is a period of time during judgment and during priestly ministry and service when the marriage uh, circumstance had to be set aside. And I think it's possible that that's what Jesus was referring to. And I'm going to show you some more passages. I, again, I'm open-minded. Whatever God has for us is going to be fine. But this is something that is particularly of interest to me to young people because I know young people who reach 17, 18, 19 years old and they've been hearing in the church, Jesus is coming, Jesus is coming, get ready, get ready. And they think to themselves, but I haven't gotten married yet and I've dreamed of having a baby and I really want to experience. And people say, well, you better do it now because it's not happening in life. It's not happening when we get to heaven. And I think that kind of causes angst that may not be necessary. Let's just put it that way. Will there be marriage? I, I, let's be open-minded. That, that's, my, that's my thing. And, and you'll see a couple passages that hints at this. And it engenders the question, is the Garden of Eden an example or not? And it's funny. We use the Garden of Eden as an example to say, well, it's an example of why we should be vegetarians. And it's an example of why we should keep the Sabbath. Because those things existed before sin and there's no death. And so we should all eat vegetables because we can be fine without that. And we, we promote and believe plant-based diets. Wonderful. And we should keep the Sabbath and it's going to last forever because it was in Eden. But then when it comes to marriage and intimacy and family, we say, well, that was just temporary. And I've read some wonderfully profound articles that, that goes into this at a deeper level. But I appreciate that Angel um, Manuel Rodriguez and others have written, let's just keep an open mind because there's more. That can, and I am respectful of spirit of prophecy, and I think that we can look at that statement and still maintain an open mind. She says there's no sure word of prophecy um, that she had on that subject. But I think there is a sure word of prophecy that hints at that, that we can use. This is the last one, a misconception. Um, people will say, don't worry about heaven, it's just going to be bliss, and whatever's there is going to be wonderful. Whether grandma's there or not, you're just going to be love, love, love. And whether your puppy is there that died that you, you know, when you were seven, it's just going to be wonderful. And by the way, having confidence and trust is fine. But this verse that is quoted, you know, eye has not seen, ear has not heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man, all the things that God has prepared for them. That verse, which is a quote from Isaiah, has nothing to do with heaven. It has to do with the mystery of salvation. It has to do with redemption. It's Paul saying, look, you have no way of understanding the depths to which God has gone to save you. Now, and I'm probably victim of this as well, of using this in, in, in times of saying, oh, you don't know, you know what happened to your loved one. God, I has not seen. I'm not saying that sentiment is wrong, but that's not what the scripture means when we read it. Not in Isaiah and not in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 either. That's, that's just, we need to be careful when we, when we use the scriptures. And by the way, the other thing I was going to say is uh, Adventists have long held the idea that you should not base strong theology on singular texts, Right? That, that you should not, uh, you should, you should let the whole breadth of scripture speak to important things. So we take exception to our, our Catholic friends who read Matthew 16 where Jesus says, you are Peter and on this rock I'll build my church in the gates of hell. And the Catholics say, that's it. The church is founded on Peter. We don't want to hear anything else about it. With all due respect, we say, yeah, but, but Peter denied Christ and he was embarrassed to eat with uh, uh, Gentiles and he was swinging, chopping off ears when Jesus was getting arrested. No, it doesn't matter. Matthew 16 is all that matters. And we say, well, we think it means the faith of Peter, not Peter himself. Or we take our evangelical friends who read about the rich man of Lazarus, and they say, well, here Jesus says that in eternity, the, the, the uh, wicked are going to suffer forever and ever, and we're going to be there watching them. We're going to be able to look across the gulf and say, see, you're getting what you deserve. And evangelicals say, I don't want to hear anything else about it. And we say, well, let's look at the broader scriptures. And I could go on with further examples. I would just say the same thing about that verse where Jesus says they will be like the angels. Let's be careful that we don't just base broad assumptions on one peculiar passage. Let's let the broader scriptures at least speak to this and keep an open mind.
I kind of like my wife. I, I, I can imagine staying with her a little bit longer in heaven. If it's God's plan. Some tangible truths about our lives in heaven. I, I want us to get beyond the heart playing on the, on the clouds and eternal church service that never ends. And I want us to look at some tangible truths about what life at the end will really look like. And there are only whispers about this in Scripture. I call it the ABCs, and they all come from Isaiah. Isaiah, the ABCs of some tangible realities about our life after sin. I just have the Scripture references. I'm not going to put the verses on the screen. I'm going to begin in Isaiah 40 with a verse you all know very well. This is the New Testament of Isaiah. Isaiah has an Old Testament and a New Testament. Isaiah chapter 40 is the beginning of Isaiah's New Testament, in case you were wondering. And in Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 40, we read a familiar verse, uh, beginning in verse 28. Isaiah has been talking about redemption and, and the plan of God. And he says, Do you not know, have you not heard, the everlasting God, the Lord of the creator of the ends of the earth, does not become weary or tired. His understanding is inscrutable. He gives strength to the weary. To him who lacks, uh, he might increase power. Though youths grow weary and tired, and vigorous men, young men, stumble badly, yet those who wait for the Lord, is this sounding familiar? You kind of read this before. Yet those who wait for the Lord, okay, will gain new strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired. They will walk and not become weary. Have you read this verse before? This is a great chicken soup for the soul verse, right? You just, beautiful. When you wait for the Lord, and the idea here is that you're going to receive eternal, internal energy, right? You're not going to become tired. So this is more than just a reference to the Christian life after salvation. This is more of a reference to the ultimate experience that God desires for us to have in the everlasting kingdom that we're going to live. And notice what it says. Now, I realize there's poetic license in this, but when he says you're going to gain new strength and you're going to mount up on wings like eagles. Now, are we going to literally have wings? I don't think Adam and Eve had wings, did they, Chuck? I don't remember the feathery wings. However, the, the idea of transportation and speed is included in the idea of having wings, whether they're metaphorical or not. And think about this. Um, we talked about this in Sabbath school. In the book of Job, when God call, kind of calls a council of, of representatives, right? And it says that Satan came from the earth, right? How did Satan come from the earth? Did he get on a spaceship? Did he get on USS Enterprise and fly into heaven? Or did he have that supernatural ability to transport himself from one location to another? The same ability that Adam probably had originally, but he lost it after sin. And how did those other sons of gods get from their planets or from their locations to God's presence? How do the angels get around? Well, of course, you know, they have wings, right? Is there anywhere in the Bible that says the angels have wings? Right here. They shall mount up on wings. Oh, it says like eagles, not angels. Is there anywhere in the Bible that says angels have wings? A little Sabbath afternoon Bible study for you. The ability to move, the ability to uh, travel and having unending strength. Okay, so here's the idea. Heaven is not going to be a status, sit still environment. We are going to be adventurers. We're going to be explorers. When you think about the earth when God created Adam and Eve. He put them in a garden, right? But he made the whole world. Had they not fallen into sin, do you think they would have just stayed in their corner of the garden? Don't you think that the original design of God was that as their family expanded, they continued to discover and go on adventures and see the beautiful world that God had made? Do you think he just made everything a big tar pit except for the, the little garden of Eden? Or the whole world was filled with his glory and beauty. And it was the pleasure of God that in that perfect experience, they were to be adventurers. Isn't that, I think that's a good idea, don't you? And the ability to travel and see new things. Any of you like astronomy? Does that fascinate any of you? Do you think that we'll have the ability to travel not only from this world, but we'll be able to transport ourselves through the power of God, throughout the vastless universe? Do you think God just made this vast, empty universe so that we could look at it through a telescope and say, well, that planet 12 billion light years away looks kind of fun, but I'll never get there. 
we are going to have the ability to be explorers, to have adventures, to do things unlike we've ever conceived before. That was the plan of God to see his creation grow and develop. And I think this verse about us having that energy and that creativity, and I could look at many other verses too to illustrate that. Oops. Isaiah 65. I want to come to that verse now. Isaiah 65. I kind of put it on the screen already. Isaiah 65 is where Revelation borrows a lot of its language from Isaiah 65. And in verse 17 of Isaiah 65, it says this, Behold, I create a new heaven and a new earth. So there's no doubt what God's talking about here. This isn't just a redeemed people living on old earth now, but having, you know, the salvation and promises of God. This is the new earth. This is where the new Jerusalem will be. And the former things will not be remembered or come to mind. Isaiah 65, verse 17. Now in verse 18, but be glad and rejoice forever from what I create. Behold, I create Jerusalem for rejoicing and her people for gladness. And, and I will also rejoice in Jerusalem and be glad in my people. And there will no longer be heard in her the voice of weeping and the sound of crying. Amen? No weeping, no crying, no pain, no death, no war. No longer, now verse 20 is a bit of a conundrum. No longer will there be in it an infant who lives but a few days. So it mentions that there will be infants but they won't perish. You know, again, go into the days in which Isaiah lived. Child mortality was huge. And the promise is that children will not die prematurely. Amen? But here Isaiah says they're going to be there. They're not going to die prematurely. An old man who does not live out his days. For the youth will die. Now, I'll come back to that in a second. Youth will die at the age of 100, and the one who does not reach the age of 100 will be thought a curse. And so here you think, well, why is he talking about death? I thought this is the new heaven. And again, most commentators would say he's just using poetic descriptions of a world beyond their comprehension. And in Isaiah 25, he already says in the new heaven and new earth, there's not going to be any death. So he's saying the youth are going to live out their days, and then they're going to grow to maturity, okay? And the children will not die prematurely. Verse 21, they will build houses, and they will plant vineyards. They will inhabit their houses. They will eat the fruit of their vineyards. They will not build and another inhabit. They will not plant and another eat. For as the lifetime of a tree, so will be the days of my people. So again, he's using a metaphor. We're going to live the longest thing that lives that they could think of at that time was a tree. And he says, it's going to be like that. We're going to live and it's going to just go on. For my chosen ones uh, will not wear out the work of their hands. Now verse 23, they will not labor in vain or bear children for calamity. In the new heaven, in the new earth, they will bear children. Is that a sure word of prophecy? So what did Jesus mean? Well, I think, I think we can look at these without throwing each one out. Or bear children for calamity, for they are the offspring of those blessed by the Lord and their descendants with them. And it will also come to pass that they will call and I, I will answer. And while they are speaking, I will hear the wolf and the lamb will graze together. The lion will eat straw like the ox. The dust of the serpent will be its food. They will do no evil or harm on all my holy mountain, thus saith the Lord. So a lot of things in there, but here's what I want to suggest. Oops, grabbed the wrong one. Here's what I want to suggest, is that we will not only be adventurers, we will be builders, planters, inventors, creators, artists. Have you ever yeah, thought what it would be like to just be able to pick up an instrument and just have it work? You know, I, I knew a guy um, in Vancouver, Washington. When he picked up the banjo, it became like an extension of his body. He was like a, 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 he was like a savant. I mean, he could just do anything he wanted with that banjo. And it was just, you know, I don't know if you don't, if you don't like bluegrass, that's, that's all right. Jesus loves you. But um, it was an amazing, and when someone can pick up a, an instrument and do it, or when someone can just, uh, anyone like Bob Ross? You know Bob Ross? Yeah, you know Bob Ross? You know, in a half hour on PBS, he would just pick up, just grab these things and just go like this. And all of a sudden you blink your eyes and there's this beautiful sunset over the lake with trees and happy rocks. Right? And you have that ability. God wants us to explore our own creativity. He's given us desires and talents. And we're going to be able to ma 
manifest that at a high at, 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 at a degree beyond which we can comprehend at this point. We're going to be builders, inventors, creators. We're going to be able to be engineers, architects, George. It's going to be something that each of us will have our own unique gift at. Isaiah 35 is the last one, the ABCs, Isaiah 35. Now, Isaiah 35 ends a five-chapter section where Isaiah has just gone through and described the entire great controversy. He's described the redemption of God's people. He's described the judgment of sin. He's described the, the uh, destruction of the earth. And in Isaiah 35, he goes in to describe the creation of the new heavens and the new earth. And I'm just going to come down to the last part of it. Verse 8 of Isaiah 35. He says, a highway will be there. This is the new earth. A highway will be there. A roadway. And it'll be called the highway of holiness. And he's actually dovetailing this in with Isaiah 11 when he talks about that highway of holiness. In Isaiah 11, he says, the wolf will dwell with the lamb, the leopard will die, lie down with the goat, the calf and the young lion and fat lean together, and a little boy will lead them. A little boy, a child, right? The cow and the bear will graze, the young will lie down together, the lion will eat straw like the ox. The nursing child will play by the hole of the cobra. You see what I mean about the Jewish understanding of the new earth? Zechariah, in Zechariah chapter 8, he describes the new earth as a place where the streets are filled with children. Zechariah 8 chapter 4. Yeah, the streets are filled with children. Well, we wouldn't want the streets filled with children right now, would we? You know, the buses and, and, and Chevys and stuff would, would make a, a mess of that. But in heaven, the children can be filled with street. Well, no, the children can be filled with children. It's hot. The street can be filled with children and it'll be safe. Amen? For the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters the sea. That highway back in Isaiah 35, the unclean will not travel on it, but it'll be for him who walks this way, and the fools will not wander on it. No lion will be there, or any vicious beast will go up on it. These will not be found there, but the redeemed will walk there. Now, these are very stylized and 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 uh, beautiful passages that we read quickly. But when we have to remember, when we get into the broader story, it says only the redeemed and ransomed will walk there. Are the angels redeemed? In a way, they're redeemed from, from some of the elements of sin. But there seems to be a special emphasis that there will be a place in heaven that is reserved only for those who've gone through the experience of sin and have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. The redeemed will only be allowed there. The ransomed of the Lord will return and will come with joyful shouting design and everlasting joy will be on their heads. And they will find gladness and joy and sorrow and sign will flee away. Now, part of what this passage is sharing is that there is a special privilege for God's redeemed people to do in the eternal kingdom that we will be living in. We will be caretakers of the message of God. We are going to be symbols and ambassadors for representing the power of God to overcome sin. Because the problem of sin will not rise up again. Why? Just because people are going to say, yep, I'm not going to do that. No, because the evidence of the results of sin will be found where? In Jesus, right? What does Jesus still have in his body after the resurrection? He still has the evidence of the penalty of sin in his body. And the redeemed of the earth will forever tell the story of what God has done in the depths of God's love to save those entra entrapped by sin. So we will live lives to the universe. When we travel, when we explore, when we build, when we, when we discover new things, we will be caretakers of the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ for eternity. Everywhere we go, we will be heralding with the everlasting joy in our heads that Jesus Christ is the sovereign Lord of the universe who will go to the uttermost to save. That does not end at the second coming. That does not end at the millennium. It does not end at the great white throne judgment. The role of the redeemed will continue even into the new earth to be part of the story of redemption with everlasting joy upon their heads. We will continue to be caretakers, messengers, heralds of God's redemption. 
So are we going to be sitting on clouds, friends? Is it going to be an eternal church service like this might feel like right now? Okay. The end of the story is much more glamorous and glory and, and wonderful when we really look at some of these beautiful passages. Now, to close this, what does this mean for us today? Well, that's wonderful. May it come and that when we get there, wonderful. Hallelujah. But what does that mean for us today? Let me suggest this. Hebrews says, Therefore, since we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken, a new earth, let us show gratitude by which we may offer to God an acceptable service with reverence and awe. If that is what the new kingdom and the new earth is going to be like, can we not learn from that and realize that we can do the same thing now? God wants our lives now to be an adventure and a discovery and an exploration of service to Him. We don't need to wait. God wants us to build and create and invent and use the artistic talents that God has given us now. They may not have all the perfection that they will have in the new Jerusalem, but we can live today these things that we will forever experience in heaven, in the new earth. And we can be representatives and caretakers and heralds and missionaries and emissaries of the plan of salvation today. We can have everlasting joy on our heads now. No need to wait till then. The end of the story tells us what we can be doing in the midst of the story today. Don't wait. I'll get rid of that addiction when the Lord comes. I'll get that vice out of my life when the Lord comes. I'll serve the Lord when it's closer to His return. I'll do great things. I'll use my talents for God in heaven. He doesn't need them here. I'll be an ambassador for God later. I think that's a mistake. Let's learn from the story and let's embrace these realities and apply them to our lives today. Amen? Let's pray. God in heaven, thank you, Father, that we can, we can dream a little bit here and we can explore different passages of the Scriptures. And we've just looked briefly at a few, and I know there's many more, and we need to be careful, uh, and we are instructed to be careful not to, uh, to be too wild in our theories. But I think these are very basic and clear things that can be found throughout the Scriptures about the joys and the opportunities and the, and the endeavors that we will participate in at the end of the story, long after sin is gone, and in the experiences that you've designed for us. But they are also things that we can learn from and apply to our lives today, Lord. We thank you that you are balancing all of the issues of the universe and doing everything possible to bring redemption to every soul that is lost. Father, we want to be part of that mission. We want to be, continue to be part of that family. Help us to use our talents. Help us to use our energies Help us to use our stories to help as many of your children be in that new earth. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you so much for being here on July 30th, 2022. VBS next week. Looking forward to a great time with the kids. VBS Sabbath next Sabbath. Have a wonderful day today. God bless you.